Thank you very, very, very much for coming today. My name is Kelly Lunston. I'm the business segment manager for advanced cytometry for BioLegend. It's kind of a complicated name for simply saying that I help um, uh, one of many people at BioLegend. I, I help um, advance new technology. So I do routinely about um, 12 to 16 color flow cytometry. And a lot of my seminars tend to focus on the different pain points of doing multicolor flow cytometry. My expertise is actually in fluorescence chemistry, um, largely the development of the brilliant violet dyes, um, that sort of thing. So I will talk a little bit about that today as well. So I do think it's kind of funny, as I've been here at this meeting, I've had a few people come up to me at the booth or other places and say, how do you guys get your antibodies? We, some of them we just license. Others, though, we do do novel clone development. And we'll do that sort of work um, under the circumstances where maybe the antibodies that are currently available either have low performance, low affinity, or there's something about them that, that could be optimized. Um, maybe epitopes that we know we could go after. And so that's, that's kind of the, one of the examples. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about the different chemokine receptor antibodies that we've been developing over the course of probably the last three years. Um, to date, I believe that we have about 14 human chemokine receptor antibodies that are entirely novel clones. So, you know, as I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room how extremely important chemokines are and the ability to sensitively detect them and quantitate them and, and show the chemokine gradient for chemotaxis. Um, they are involved in pretty much every disease state that you can imagine. They're involved in HIV vaccines and all sorts of cellular vaccines as well. So, you know, the the importance of having good tools in this area cannot be underemphasized. What I'm going to talk about today is actually, you can break it down topic-wise into two sections. First would be that as we do develop new clones, there is the possibility that they're going to have utility, obviously, outside of the main area of flow cytometry. So we are trying to make a more concerted effort to test them for things like imaging applications, microscopy, uh, maybe IHC, but also for their functional activity. Um, especially for chemotaxis, it can be extremely valuable to know whether or not you can block that chemotaxis. It's very relevant for cancer and many other things. So what I'm going to talk about are um, how you would normally do a chemotaxis assay or how you would normally do a functional blocking assay when we do it in-house is you would artificially express that protein in a particular cell line or that re particular receptor on a, on a cell line. Um, it's quite artificial, but hey, you know for sure that you have a lot of that receptor and it's ubiquitously expressed. Um, that wasn't necessarily going to be possible for me to use that type of model um, to assess the new chemokines. Um, so I thought one of the solutions to that in terms of being able to expand up a large number of cells was simply to use different human cancer cell lines. So um, I tried many different cell lines. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but the HUT78s were, it's a human T-cell, um, a hu a human T-cell lymphoma um, cell line. It was by far the best model that, that I could use. And so most of the data that I'm going to show you today is on the HUT78s. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you the, the ins and outs of the chemotaxis assay. How many of you guys have ever done a chemotaxis assay or tried to block chemotaxic activity before? It was, it was definitely a learning curve. I had a lot of help from our, in, you know, from our actual scientists who do this on a daily basis in-house. Um, but it's definitely, there's a lot of variability in these assays. So I'm going to go over what the protocol was that I followed. Um, it was only a first pass. This is not my primary responsibility. <laughs> so when I wasn't necessarily getting a blocking effect, it doesn't mean that it doesn't block. It just means the protocol that I used maybe wasn't the most ideal for that particular target. Um, but I will tell you what that is so you can see you know, maybe apply that to your research as well. Um, and then the second part of it, which is what I do normally talk about, um, is a very high um, content flow cytometry. So in this instance, I broke down three different subsets, NK cells, T cells, B cells, and basically my monocytes, macrophage, dendritic cells, into three separate panels, and did either 13 to 16 color flow cytometry on each of these panels. Um, and we'll kind of, I'll talk about that more when we get to it. All right, so these were the cell lines that I initially assessed. And I just kind of looked through our tissue bank or, or our cell line bank, and I said, what, what would have the greatest biological diversity amongst them? And as I said, the, um, the, sorry, the HUT78 leukemia cell line ended up giving me by far the most hits to keep this project chugging for quite a while. 
Um, but I did try Molt 4s and Colo 205s. The 205s, they um, were semi-adherent, so some were adherent and some were not. They ended up not being a very good cell type for this sort of assay. But I did have a bunch of adherent cells as well. And I'm going to talk about the challenge of um, when you do have a human sample like that as well, um, dissociating them, treating them. As we all know, chemo chemokine receptors can be extremely sensitive to how they're treated, how they're stressed, what temperature they're at. You know, they can be easily downregulated. So not perturbing an adherent cell line or maybe something in tissue can be, you know, very integral to not confounding the data. So I'll go over that as well. So just to begin with the chemotaxis assay, I would begin with, um, I would begin by plating a, a dilution series from zero to 500 nanograms per mil of the um, chemokine of interest that we know was specific for that receptor. Um, we would add me media to the, to the actual wells so that the cells wouldn't stick to the wells, and then we would add in about um, seven and a half million cells per mil, which ended up being about 300 cells per, 300,000 cells per, per well. Um, you let it sit there at about 37 degrees for about an hour and a half to get chemotaxis. You give it a quick little spin just to make sure that nothing's sticking to the bottom of the, of the actual um, tactic well. Um, and then I think what's most important to understand, especially because it introduces a little bit of variability in the assay, is that before you go to actually just do a cell count, it's an absolute cell count. So you're, you're spiking in about 5,000 absolute, um, so 5,000 beads to do an absolute cell count in order that no matter what the volume is, no matter how diluted those cells are, there's still 5,000 beads in that. And that's what you're relating then to the total capture of events. So I would capture about maybe 1,500 bead events and then relate that to then how many cells I captured during the same period of time. So then when, when I do the curve and I, I determine what the ideal concentration of the chemokine is, now I need to figure out what the ideal concentration of the blocking antibody might be. But again, there can be some variability in these. You know, I'm doing most of these on my bench you know, as I'm preparing the cells and such like that, and then putting it back into 37 degrees for the actual chemotaxis. It could be possible that leaving it at room temperature would have been better, or maybe shortening the time at 37 degrees would have been better as well. Or increasing the amount of time that I'm exposing the blocking antibody to the cells, that can also be a factor to be changed. Um, in this instance, the antibody range that we're typically working at is about, um, 60, about zero to 60 micrograms per mil. Um, there is the possibility we could use even more, but usually there was a sweet spot in there historically that we found to be the right amount of antibody um, for the number of receptors on that cell. So in this instance, you know, the amount that you're actually adding to the well of the chemokine is consistent. We already found what the optimal was to create the chemotactic event, um, but all we're varying then is the amount of antibody that's used for the blocking event, but everything else basically remains the same. And again, we're using the absolute cell counting beads to do the cell count in the end as well. And that's a certain amount of variability. So one of the ways, you know, when I have all these different cell lines, we have a project, a, a new product. It's called um, Legend Screen. And it is basically a, a lyophilized plate that has every single antibody in a PE format, basically for you to go fishing on your biology with. Um, it's pretty cool. And I'm like, loving the idea that I can just take my cells, plop them into a well, and literally 15 minutes or like 20 minutes later be on the cytometer analyzing my data. It was the fastest way to screen something that I've ever done. So I, I asked for um, a custom, I had my guys, you know, laugh me, just my chemokine receptor antibodies as well as my isotype controls into the plate so I could just that quickly go through these screens of all of these cell types. It was awesome. Um, so one of the questions that I did have though, you know, this is a T cell leukemia line. I don't expect a lot of FC binding, but I do want to make sure that I'm not accidentally introducing any variability. So in this instance, what you're looking at here are on the HUT 78s, um, any positive hits that I'm getting. So I can actually do the chemotaxis assays on, on, on those particular targets. So in this instance, um, I wasn't seeing any FC staining. I got really very low background in, in, in total. And the positive hits that I got are CD183, CD194, and CD198, which was awesome. So I started with, um, um, with the CXCR3, which is the CD183. 
I tend to say CD183. I'm, it's very, it's going to be very confusing to keep switching between the nomenclature. So I hope you, you understand what I'm talking about. I found that how chemotaxis was induced and whether or not there was maybe a normal curve to it or, or the shape of the curve um, was entirely different for each chemokine receptor. So in the instance of CD183, um, I found that there was really no limit to how, much I could, how many cells I could entice across the membrane. Um, other cell lines that I'll show you, they actually probably became overstimulated, maybe started to downregulate, but at the very, very higher concentrations started to decrease their chemotactic response. So in this instance, I could take it all the way to 500 nanograms per mil, and these cells were perfectly content to, to follow the, the gradient. That's way overkill, right? I do, not need, I do not need that much. I had actually done this assay first at about 100 nanograms per mil, only to realize that that was honestly probably too much for the blocking assay. I settled upon about um, 60 nanograms per mil for the actual blocking assay. And in this instance, um, I found absolutely fantastic blocking. So um, what you're looking at here is in, in purple is the isotype control that's at a match concentration, a match dilution series. Um, the black here is going to be the varying concentrations microgram per mil of the CD183 or the anti-CD183. So that was fantastic, but that's not always going to be the case, right? So the next target that I went after was the um, CD194, the CCR4. And in this instance, it actually did have a bit more of that potential for that I'd started to downregulate the mark or the, the receptor. So, but it was a very, very fast response. The kinetics for each of these were like a personality or a fingerprint. They were all extremely different from one another. Um, I could use only 10 nanograms per mil and absolutely you know, get excellent um, chemotaxis. But when I used, um, when I varied the concentration of the CD194, I really didn't see any blocking that was meaningful for the, um, for the, the CD194. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't. Under the conditions of my protocol, this antibody wasn't working for that blocking potential. For the CD198, the, the third target that I had found to be positive on the HUT78s, um, I again found that it was probably starting to downregulate a little bit at the highest concentration, but I really didn't need it again at about you know, 20 to 40 nanograms per mil. I was seeing fantastic chemotaxis. So it was actually, this was awesome. I had, I had gone away on a trip for a while. I'd been gone for like a month and I'd come back and I was like, oh, I've really just got to get this CD198 blocking assay done before I go to AAI. And then I ended up getting this result where I saw an extremely clear about 50% blocking efficiency of the CD198 on these cells. It was absolutely not 100%. And honestly, it about plateaus. I don't think going above 60 microgram per mil is going to help me. I'm sure I'm saturating at this point. So it definitely gives you a question about what the, what the dynamic or the, the kinetics are of um, this particular association. Um, so those were the three that I worked on. When it came to adherent cell lines, um, MCF7, a549, um, they make fantastic images. Um, I did a really quick screen. You know, I had I'd known from my colleagues that dissociation methods were, were a very good possibility of perturbing um, my receptors, that it wasn't going to be something I could rely on for flow cytometry. I don't know if you've ever used MCF7s. They do not give up the ghost on that plate. <laughs> I, would, I would put that PBS for 30 minutes to try to get it as cold as possible before it froze. And it didn't matter how hard I shocked them. They didn't want to come off the plate very well. It wasn't going to be a consistent method of getting them. I needed to use a dissociation method. So I tried um, both trypsin and Accutase. And I found that although some of them were very similar, where maybe I really wasn't hurting the chemokine receptor all that much as I could tell by flow and as using the PBS as a control, but there were definitely instances that told me that, dissoci that dissociation methods were absolutely going to change my results by flow. And so after I saw this result, I thought, There's, I'm not going to use these for flow. Well, first of all, they're not great for a chemotaxis assay. Adherent cells require an entirely different protocol. They don't migrate through the membrane in the same way. It was going to be a much more involved process. So if I wanted to characterize the receptors on these cells, I had to do it by IF, which was fine. I've got all these cell lines that are beautifully adherent. So 
And we just got a really nice microscope at BioLegend. We've been pursuing a lot of microscopy reagents. I was more than excited to have something fun to play with on my new scope. One of the questions was fixation can also affect your chemokine receptors. So, you know, and it's a general question of immunology in, you know, using a microscopy platform as well. Do you have to label live like we do in flow? Or is there the potential that we can fix perm and add the reagent and get identical results? And that's absolutely not going to be known for any of these you know, receptor antibodies. So in this instance, what you should be seeing um, is the green staining here is the CD194 Alexa 647. Um, it was really beautiful staining on my live cells. Um, when I fixed the cells, so this is that the cells are labeled live and then they're fixed and then they go straight to the scope. I mount them in antifade, we're golden. Um, the second instance here, this image here, the cells were fixed first, permed, and then the reagent was added. Um, the red here is a new reagent that we're releasing called Flash Floyd in Red. Uh, fantastic, very bright, very photostable. Um, and I also used some Cytox Green, which is the counter stain here in blue. Um, what I found was basically that the localization was very similar. The quality of the images was a little different. The, the, the staining on the cells that were fixed was much more diffuse, but it was still what we expected. Um, and also all of the cells tended to, not all, most, a good portion um, were positive. I didn't have a lot of negative events. However, when I did exactly the same thing with um, the CD183 BV421, we have a custom filter for our BV421. It's a fantastic floor to use for phenotyping a blue emitting fluorophore, but it does not always fit into everyone's DAPI filter. We have a custom filter. I can share with you what that is in the end. This was like totally amazing. My cells were gorgeous. And what, was, what you should be able to see here, if you could see the phalloidin staining, is that these cells are synapsing and these cells are synapsing. And where he is synapsing right here is the density of this receptor. And where he's synapsing here is the density of this receptor. It was so beautiful. However, when I tried to apply this antibody to the cells that were fixed, it went straight to the nucleus. I was with molecular probes for six years. I've looked at a lot of microscopy images that y'all have sent us over the years. Any reagent that goes straight to your nucleus and is not intended to be there, that's entirely nonspecific binding. So it was, so that's the result I got. I can't use it on fixed cells. That's okay. It looked fantastic on my live cells and it survives fixation. All right, so we have a few tools online that I used heavily. I should, I always give the caveat that I am not an immunologist. I work at Biologen and it never ceases to amaze me that I work at, a, at an extremely immunology dense company. My expertise really is fluorescence chemistry and this multicolor flow. Um, so I, I rely very heavily on my colleagues and on our online tools like this. Um, this is a chemokine receptor table. So basically I know that I have three positive hits like CD183. It helps me find whatever the chemokine um, is for that particular receptor. It's a really nice tool. And also we have a new um, poster that's, that's specifically about chemokine receptor biology. And from that, what you're not seeing down here, are these are all specific cell types like Tregs and B cells or activated, whatever. Um, and it gives you what chemokine receptors you should expect to be expressed. Granted, what we see in humans is that, and what I'm gonna show you in my data, it, does, it gives you no indication of how abundantly these things are expressed or the fact that they're expressed on every cell Every B cell does not express the same chemokine receptors, right? Um, it depends on what their, their function is and, and how they've been directed. But these gave me an idea of where I should begin to look. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about is how to build um, you know, 14 to 16 color assays. And fundamentally, no matter what you wanna look at, your very first limitation is simply gonna be your instrument. And I don't know if anyone saw on the Purdue listserv. Does anybody pay attention to the flow cytometry listserv? But Mario just put out an announcement. Uh, Mario Roder just put out an announcement that Pratip is going to give a talk at Cyto where he just broke the, uh, I want to say it was the 30 color barrier um, on a Fortessa. So how much fun is that? <laughs> it opens up a lot of potential for all of us. Um, but by far, your instrumentation is just your first layer of limitation. I don't have a lot of limitations. We developed the Brilliant Viet, so we got a totally, you know, quite pimped out for Tessa. Um, I have a full octagon for all of my violet floors. 
Um, but you may, this may not be the case for you. Or you may have five lasers, or you may have seven lasers. You may have an even cooler machine than I do. But that's fundamentally what's going to restrict what you can do. Uh, the second are going to be your fluorophores. So not all fluorophores are created equal. Um, historically, we've always had synthetic organic floors like Fitzy, Sci-5, Sci-5.5, Alexa 700. And these things are quite easy to make. They're, they were originally found often in nature, and they were just tweaked in order to become more photostable, more soluble, more useful for us in, in, um, in biology as reporters for the existence of our target. Um, but they're also not particularly bright. These molecules are anywhere between 500 to 1,000 Daltons. They're extremely small. That number may not mean much to you unless you consider that PE is about 240 kilodaltons. So these guys are tiny, tiny, tiny little fluorophores that are co directly covalently attached to the antibody. And although it may not be you know, the American way, <laughs> more is not better in biology. So there's only going to be so many of these synthetic organic fluorophores that I'm capable of conjugating to an antibody before I quench the signal in it, in it entirely. So I'm always going to be limited as to how bright I can make any particular antibody, period, just because of limited space and limited brightness. Um, so that's why we've, we've come to rely so heavily on PE and APC in different proteins. GFP, obviously being quite revolutionary because it would always tell me I had one protein to one fluorescent signal. But PE and APC, because they are 200, well, PE is 240 kilodaltons, the majority of which is non-fluorescent protein. It's matrix. It's holding the chromophore in place so that the floor can be rigid. The phycobilin here, the structure, can be held rigid by that matrix in order to become fluorescent. And that's why PE is so sensitive to its environment. The minute that I denature that protein scaffolding, if I hurt it whatsoever, I kink it at all, all of the entire um, 3D matrix of that PE will fall apart, quenching all of the chromophores that are embedded inside it. So obviously it has a large powerhouse of potential unless I look at it wrong, in which case it's going to fall apart on me. But we use it as a, as a tandem, so tandem being the transfer of energy between a donor and, a, and an acceptor. And we do that because in flow cytometry, we only ever had two lasers, right? Except calibers, right? You had one laser, or scans, you had one laser. Well, now we have three, four, five, you know, up to seven. Um, we can get more discrete excitation of, of individual organic fluorophores. But in the beginning, we had to rely on these guys in order to get us multiple spe you know, specific wavelengths of emission. Um, and that's not always an entirely efficient process. We're always going to have some spill back into the channel of the donor. And there's nothing we can do about that. We can't quench that signal 100%. And we were stuck here for a long, long time, just trying to tweak them to make them slightly more stable or slightly brighter or slightly more quenched. But, you know, until we got into nanocrystals and into different organic polymer technology, we were, you know, limited to get beyond about eight colors. Well, with the advent of Q-dots and, and different nanocrystal technology, we could get up to 18. Maybe it wasn't the cleanest way to get up to 18, but we could get there. Um, but there was a lot of limitations to Q-dots that made them not so user-friendly. And so at some point, we were approached by Serogen to consider co-developing the Brilliant Violets with them. Is everybody familiar with the Brilliant Violet technology? I'm going to assume that you all are at this point, because they've been around for about three or four years. Um, I'm not going to go heavily into it outside of the fact that it is a long linear polymer inside which each individual monomer encases a single fluorophore. And each monomer that's added to that long strand increases the total brightness of the antibody that it's conjugated to. So we control the brightness by how long that polymer is, um, but there's other factors that play into their utility. For example, we rely very heavily on the base polymer, which is Brilliant Violet 421 or Brilliant Violet 510. Outside of that, we have to make tandems out of them. Anytime you have any molecule that's organic and it has a short wavelength of excitation and a long wavelength of emission, that's physically impossible for an organic floor by itself. It has to be in tandem. It has to transfer energy in order to have that large of a stoke shift. Um, so however that may be marketed to you, that's the physical reality of how you accomplish that spectrum. So in this instance, we have seven different brilliant violets, two of which are the polymer by themselves, and the other five of which 
are all going to be tandems with an acceptor molecule. However, you know, when they were first released, everyone's like, oh my god, cross-beam promiscuity or cross-beam excitation. How are these, you know, you're putting a tandem together, those acceptors are going to excite off of other lasers. They do a little bit, but we had the advantage of being able to choose our own acceptors. So obviously we're going to choose ones that give us the best signal, the best transfer of energy with the least amount of cross-beam compensation. This was a conscious choice we were able to make because we could control the process. So if you ever want to look at any of my comp matrices, how I set up my cytometer in order to balance these things and not create too much spreading error, you are welcome to a plethora of data that I could share with you. All right, so that's kind of the, the cohort of reagents I have to choose from. Each of them is going to have a different degree of brightness. And I help people develop 15, 16 color panels multiple times a week. It is not as simple as just matching the brightness of the antigen, or sorry, the brightness of the fluorophore to the abundance of the antigen. It's that easy when you're below eight because the spectral spillover isn't as significant as it is once you go above 10. When you go above 10, the most important factor to consider is how you're going to analyze. It's easy for you to collect the data. It's easy for you to just run your tube and get the data spit back out at you. But your challenge comes when all that spillover has created things like digital error or the, re the requirement for um, controls like fluorescence minus one controls in order that when you're gating, you have confidence in what you see. But you still have to use all the tools that you have. When I look at something like this, I pull out my favorite fluorophores, things like PE, BV421, um, Alexa 647, Alexa Fluor 488, and I hold them back from assigning them initially to my primary tier um, antigens because they're going to be the things that I want to put on my most special and most important antigens. <clears throat> All right, so initially when I first started, when I, when I moved to San Diego to work at the home office, people would ask me, what is the logic by which you make the choices for the panels that you construct? And I mean, these fluorophores are my family. <laughs> I've been working with these fluorophores since I was 24 with molecular probes. I have a very innate knowledge of them. And I realized that maybe this doesn't come as naturally to other people. So I started creating what I believe to be kind of the logic of my reasoning. If I'm gonna go after um, a full 19 parameters or, or 17 colors, I have to use every single one of the fluorophores on this list including things like the zombie dyes, which are our version of a live dead fixable viability. Um, it's just we have a better sense of humor when we name things. But my favorite is zombie near infrared because I don't really love the APC Psi 7 channel. I don't love having to put it on my most abundant markers. I don't love that it has a tendency to break down a bit over time. So I like to use it for my dump channel because that's what viability is. I'm excluding those markers from the rest of my detection. Um, when I go to 15 colors or 17 parameters, I can get rid of some of my more problematic floors. PE Psi 5 is a level 5 brightness on a scale of 1 to 5. He's outrageously bright and he's extremely promiscuous. He spills into all of his neighbors. If I'm going to use him, and I have to use him when I'm doing 16 colors, I'm going to make sure that I'm able to dump him as best I can. I want to exclude him from analysis. It doesn't mean I don't use him, but I make sure that he doesn't screw up the rest of my panel. Um, Brilliant Violet 570 is actually a pretty good reagent. It's just really middle of the road. Um, but in this instance, if I have seven markers all emitting off of a single laser line, I'm going to start to weed out the complexity of all of those seven packed up against each other. And then eventually I'll go down to, say, 12 colors, 10 colors, and then getting into fixed um, configuration instruments make relatively basic choices. But again, when I get down to eight color panels, that's really not even close to being as complicated as constructing a 16 color panel. There's a lot less logic that you need to apply. All right, so I have my instrument that was a limitation. I have my fluorophores to choose from that are going to be limitations. Um, and then hopefully you're going to know what markers you actually want to look at. You have no idea how many times you guys email us in tech services and say, I'd like to look at this population. What marker should I use on those? Well, that's something you need to come to the table with. We can't actually do that, that part of the science for you. Um, so in this instance, I had a lot of help, and also I'm really only interested in the chemokine receptor antibodies that we developed in-house. Um, so my primary tier is on the left here. I use DRAC7. Has anybody used DRAC7 before? I actually really like it quite a bit. It goes into the Alexa 700 channel, and it's simply an impermeant nucleic acid stain because in my 
in my assay, I have no need to fix these cells. I'm not going after any cytokines or transcription factors. I was only going after surface receptors. So I, I have no reason necessarily to use a live dead fixable probe, and I was quite happy with the performance of the DRAC7. Um, in this instance, I'm putting something like Percy PSI 5.5, which has a lot of promiscuity as well. I'm going to put it on a marker like CD3 that is a yes or no answer, so that if I had it on something that was variably expressed, then that means I'm creating a lot of variability in the background of all of the channels into which Percy PSI 5.5 spills. That's also a conscious choice that I will always make when I'm building a panel. Um, the other thing here that you should see is I have CD15, which is um, a granulocyte marker. I have that on my PE sci fi because I'm not interested in anything on those granulocytes. And the nice thing is also, um, granulocytes do like to eat things, right? You'll often find that they have a little bit of nonspecific binding for many of your antibodies. Um, so by putting it on a marker like PE sci fi that can tend to have that propensity with this, I'm only further excluding them from analysis. So I was quite happy. Also, CD56, although it's in my primary tier, it's not the brightest or most abundant antigen. So I'm putting it on something like PE Psi 7. For the rest of these guys, you'll see that I saved my very most favorite fluorophores in the world because they're the most important question that I'm asking in this, in this assay. I had thought about trying to consolidate these into maybe two panels, um, but it wasn't actually possible based on on maintaining my primary tier to include all my phenotypic markers. I could have chosen to, to create dump channels for everything I wasn't interested in and then expand out the selection of chemokine receptor antibodies that I was able to detect on that sample. There's other ways I could have organized this to have more interesting secondary tier content. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is titrate my antibodies. <laughs> Most people would do serial dilutions. Instead, I do five microliters, four microliters, three microliters, two microliters, one microliters. Shazam. But the issue with any sort of dilution, although it's the, by far one of the most important things that you do when you're setting up a 14 plus color assay, you don't want to have too much protein around that could potentially create aberrations. Um, and you don't really want to spend the majority of your budget on all your reagents when a fraction of that would have been necessary. Um, so you just kind of see the overlays here. And what I'm doing to determine what the optimal concentration is staining index, which is my MFI um, positive minus my, my MFI negative divided by two times my standard deviation. And the reason that it's important to do staining index instead of signal to noise is that it takes into account that distribution of the negative. That's as important to my ability to resolve my population as simply where the two mean populations are. Okay, so as I'm doing this titration, and I say, well, I found the optimal concentration in microliters that I'm gonna use. Well, great. As you might know, when we provide things in test format, it's not always the same microgram per mil concentration in every vial that you receive if you order over the course of time. So what's most important for you to take home from this is that when I do say, hey, this many microliters was the right concentration, you have to convert that to microgram. So that should the concentration of the vial you actually receive change, you have it marked in your notebook what was the appropriate amount for your assay. OK? All right, so I'm just going to go through my basic phenotyping structure really quickly. Uh, we have about maybe like 15 minutes left here just to go over the data. Um, <laughs> I, I always feel like every time I do a big experiment, what I learn most is almost always about software and just the challenges of analysis. It is easy to acquire. It's not even that difficult to plan the assay. It's on the backside when you have multiple samples, humongous files, that sort of complexity, all the error that's in there um, to kind of parse all that out. I tend not to do a lot of scattergating because I have so many phenotypic markers in there I don't want to accidentally remove something just because it didn't happen to fall in the same scatter gate. So I start out with first identifying simply my CD15 negative and my DRAC5, my DRAC7 negative, so my lymphocytes and my live cells. Um, and then I have obviously my granulocytes here as well that are plotted for each of the five donors that I used. Um, not a tremendous amount of variability between them. 
And then I can always take these plots and back and backgate on scatter to make sure that they are actually falling in the you know, within the areas that I expected to find them with only a very small degree of contamination from those granular sites that I will lose with, fur with further phenotyping. So from here, um, I'm, you know, this is the issue with bivariates, right? I've got to go step by step by step by step to get to the final information that's interesting to me from, from each of these basic markers. So in order to, my first step here, I usually almost always go to CD19 versus CD3, so I get my B cells versus the rest of my lymphocytes. Um, in this case, um, there was a limited amount of variability. I always had some outliers, but all these guys, to our knowledge, are, are just healthy donors. I can take from my CD3s, go to my four versus my eight. Um, in this case, these guys were a perfect pair for each other. Um, absolutely what I would expect, but I definitely had some instances where my four to eight ratio was about equal. That was probably where I saw the greater variability um, with, between my normal healthy donors was that the, between the fours and eights sometimes not being necessarily a 30-60, but being, or a 40-60, but being more of like a 50-50. Okay, when I backgate on these guys, I see I've lost all my granulocytes, I've lost all my monocytes. It's exactly what I expect. All right. From here, from my, my non-B cells, my non-lymphocytes, this negative population here, I'm going to be able to go after my CD56 positive. I can put that guy against anybody. I could have put him against scatter as well. So the CD11C here is a bit random. Just to plot him against to pull out my 56, make sure that they're clean. Um, and then I have my 11C versus my 14 to go after my monocytes and my DCs. But in those instances where I had a panel, where I was interested in actually looking at receptors on my DCs, I need as many events as I can possibly get because there are so few that are circulating, that are resident. I need to get um, enough to make it meaningful. So this is what this looked like. I definitely found a much greater degree of variability within my macrophage, my monocyte, my DC population for probably all sorts of reasons. So this was actually just done on, on blood that was lysed first, washed. It wasn't on um, PBMCs. It was just on lysed washed blood. All right, so I'm going to kind of break it down into the different subsets that I saw. So when I start on the NK cells, um, I look at each of the individual expression of each of the chemokine receptor antibodies that I used for that particular panel, which there were six of them. This was the largest panel that I had. There's a massive amount of variability between normal people. We all know this. What I'm interested in is how do I interrogate those differences, right? How do I compare them meaningfully? So I'm going to show you the difference between here, um, the first donor, the fourth donor for CD194, and then um, the second donor and the fifth donor for CD195. So if you've ever seen me talk before, I will always spend at least half my seminar talking about fluorescence minus one controls. And <laughs> chemokine receptor, you know, chemokine receptor expression is no different. It is not a yes or no answer. When I break it down, I can see cells that are just beginning to express that receptor to what those that are extremely highly expressing different receptors. So every once in a while, I'll find one where it's quite discreet, where ev almost you know, half the cells in that population are expressing it strongly, and that's about it. That's so rare, right? So anytime you're doing chemokine detection or, or transcription factor detection, you have to use fluorescence minus one controls as your negative gating control so that you have the confidence that you are always only beginning to gate on positive events when you are past the FMO. So in this instance, I hope that you can see the red from here. I have a plot that's overlaid with its FMO so you can see where I decided to draw the gate. So for donor one, um, he, they're actually about, you can see that the gates begin at about the same place. I used, even though each donor was analyzed on different days, I used the same voltages applied to my machine, which passed CST equally across that time period. So it was highly internally consistent that um, these gates are relevant to one another. So, but between the two donors, I see a humongous degree of variability. But especially these populations, most people would have drawn their gate here. Do you see how there's a bit of a, of a, of a closure or as if there's the beginning of a new population? But it's not actually true. 
I'm more accurate by using my FMO to know. And in this instance, instead, a fluorescence minus one control is normally the negation of that one marker in order that you can gate on that marker of interest. So it tells you where all of the background is except for the signal of interest, right? Where you begin that gate. Sometimes, especially with dendritic cells or mono monocytes or macrophage, I'll use an isotype control in lieu of negating the antibody in the event that there's any background coming from any nonspecific binding due to, you know, any sort of ingestion or nonspecific binding due to the floor or the FC, you know, receptor. So in this case, just for giggles, I put in Alexa Floor 48 isotype, which is often a little bit you know, broader of an FMO. And this is significantly more accurate rather than just doing it by eye. My mantra regarding FMOs is always, this is not art class, this is science. If you can't produce the controls by which you derive the statistics, you should never be presenting them, let alone publishing them. All right, so when I look at my T cell expression, I again have, have some that, and so I'm breaking it down here, CD4, CD8 with CD194 expression. CD4, CD8, 197 expression, right? Because there was a big, obviously, a big variability just between CD4 positive and 8 positive with um, receptor abundance. So here is an instance with the same donor um, where the difference between, say, CD197 expression wasn't that big on CD4, but it was on their CD8s. So in this instance, you can see that the distribution of the 4 and 8 is a little bit different. They weren't totally 50-50. Um, as they are here for donor four. This did not, was actually the inverse of what happened for the receptor expression though. So I love, I love having plots like this. You cannot tell me that without an FMO you would have been, ever been able to do that by eye. Every single one of us could have come up here with a marker and drawn an entirely different gate as to what we thought was positive here. So that's how when I overlay here in red the fluorescence minus one for this marker, I know very clearly where the beginning of a positive signal begins for that population. So this is the CD197 expression. Um, this is what it looks like on my CD8 positive cells where it is actually significantly more discrete. Um, and this is also the population where we saw a significantly higher degree of variability between the two, 20% versus 68% on this person. All right, so I'm going to sit on my soapbox here for the ne next 10 minutes <laughs> about how difficult it is when you're doing... How many of you do transcription factors, cytokines, and receptor detection at the same time? That is, that's, that's most of us all the time now. Our tools, our ability to interrogate things down to the molecular level is growing. We want to correlate those things with our upstream biology. Well. Right now, we're limited seriously with our software, and we have been for a long time, by being required to conduct bivariate gating, by going from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and often completely missing possibly relevant associations because we didn't know to do that path of analysis. So what I'm gonna show you here is what it, um, you know, looking at things that are either expressing two chemokine receptors or three, or the potential for four, I do have four in this panel, but it's mostly three that um, were actually co-expressed. So how you would have to do this in a bivariate method, whether you were using FCS Express or Flojo or Diva or any other of the most commonly available softwares that you may have in your, at your university, you would have to choose just two of them, just any two of them. <laughs> in this case, it could be CD194 or CD197 to try to find the double positives of that population. So what you're seeing here are the FMOs in blue and red so that I can draw that gate to isolate the double positive cells from those. Or I could have chosen to start with CD194 and CD198. It doesn't matter. I'm looking at triple positives. I can start with any two of the three in this combination. I should always finish with the same number, no matter how I approached it, right? Um, so in this instance, if I had started with 197 and, one, and 194, then I would have plotted it against the 185. Just against scatter would have been fine because I'm only looking at what's singly positive here. And this I can call positive for all three chemokine receptors. 
Does this frustrate anybody else? Because it's, it's, do you know how long this takes to do? This, could, this took me probably a month to go through all the possible, it's like going down 10 different rabbit holes, each with its own workspace, so that you're not constantly screwing up the analysis that you did previous to it, right? Or if I had started with 185 and 194 and then had gone to 197 here, I'm hoping to God that those two things are the same because by doing it this way, there's always the possibility that I'm introducing human error to that selection, right? I'm potentially confounding those results. So <laughs> that was actually how I was going to finish this talk because that's my constant pain. I, this isn't even a good example. Most people want to look at six things that are co-expressed, not even just three, right? And then I was talking to my friend who is working at Cytobank, and he's like, well, obviously, you can use either nearest neighbor or principal component analysis type software that we've all heard about, right? We hear about it at users group meetings all the time. Um, but since I had an expert at my disposal who could help me walk through Spade, I decided to try to apply my data to it and see if we could make it meaningful. I am not going to give you a lecture on Spade. There are plenty of people who can teach you about software. I'm a floor for a girl, so I'm not going to get into it. But I am going to explain basically how the analysis was conducted. What you're seeing here was allowed to collect as many different variability, like degree of variability as possible. It's basically 200 nodes we allowed it to collect. That means that we allowed a large degree of binning. What we start with is a more macroscopic level. We say, hey, I'm feeding you all of these parameters all from this flow file. The only thing we're excluding before we get to the first step are our granulocytes and our dead cells. Everything else, we're asking the software to pick out by itself, to cluster it, the meaningful co-expressed information together and then align it on the tree. So in this instance, we begin by clustering CD4, CD8, and CD19, right? That's one family. This is only a T cell and a B cell panel. It's able to cluster my monocytes, my macrophage, and my NK cells, but in this instance, I didn't include um, chemokine receptor antibodies that were pertinent for those populations. So in my mind, they're relatively excluded. We're only going to look at these three. So from those cells, so what, what's awesome about this, these aren't separate workspaces. I'm organizing each of the individual clustered populations of co-expression at the same time. So as I'm doing CD4, as I'm looking at my CD185 clustering information, so the degree to which each of these is expressing CD185 within my CD4 cells, within my B cells, right? I can do it all at once, right? I can organize them into my little sections of co-expression in order that I'm going to be able to extract out the statistics on each of these the same way that I would ex export it from Flojo or FCS Express to Excel. So in this instance, what I'm highlighting is um, individual nodes that when I click on them, I can see the entire content of what they decided was, um, was co-expressed enough or alike enough to relate to one another. So in this instance, I'm looking at CD185. This is the heat map. When it's red, it means it's a very high level of CD185 expression. But when I click on that, uh, the, those cells there, I can go to this bivariate over here choose to look at whatever other parameters I want to look at this CD185 high population. So in this instance, I can plot it against CD194 and CD197 and see that, yeah, he's CD185 high. He's also CD197 positive, but he's not CD194 positive. He is a phenotypically distinct subpopulation, right? And then I look at all of his neighbors. They're all identical to this. I can reduce the degree of binning so that they merge together probably, but we didn't decide to do that in the two days that we had for me to analyze this data before the presentation. So what I loved was just my ability to curate the information. All right, so when I went to CD197 and I have to approach each of my chemokines still one by one, but I'm, a, I'm bringing up one, looking at its heat map and organizing it. Then I bring up the next one and further organize it, right? Um, it's just a step-by-step -step process. So in this instance, I'm highlighting these very large population of CD4 positive cells that are all CD197 high. CD197 of all my chemokines tended to be the marker or the, the receptor that was most variably expressed. 
amongst all my different cell types. Um, in this instance, when I looked at that population, I could also see that it was negative for CD194 and CD185. So this entire population was only positive for CD197. Okay, great, but I'm still finding events where they are co-expressed, or these nodes where they are co-expressed. So now, after doing two, I'm on my third chemokine receptor. Well, this guy, when I click on him, so that only the events over here are from this particular population of cells, and I'm looking at CD194, so he's yellow, which means that he's about a, a, a low to positive, there were no negative events in there, he's low to positive, for CD194, but he's very positive for CD197 um, and about mid-range for his CD185 expression. But he's still positive for all three, and this took me probably a total of five hours to get to. It's, it's just, this is the revolution that we need to come, is this sort of nearest neighbor or principal component analysis um, method for anyone who's doing high-level flow, um, flow cytometry analysis. So it was interesting, as I already knew that there was this population because I had done all that bivariate gating before, right? What I didn't look at yet, previous to doing it the last two days, was this population in the CD8 um, positive T cells where all of them were expressing CXCR, um, CX3, CR1, but this population here was also expressing CD194 and CD197. So I also had a second population that was expressing all three. From here, again, I would take each of those individual bubbles that describe a distinct phenotype and extract out the, the meaningful numbers and percents that I can use for, for further analysis. <clears throat> so whether or not that, <laughs> that spade analysis totally makes sense to you, there's a whole bunch of people over at the Fluidime booth that would love to talk to you about it. We're not even selling it. I'm just demonstrating to you that it was a big solution maker for me um, and it would be for anyone who's trying to look at this sort of complex, interrelated, co-expressing kind of information. So there's a lot of people I have to thank for this. Um, my boss, the Zung, who's sitting right over there, he's the director of marketing. Feel free to come over and talk to him. He's a great guy. Uh, Miguel Tam helped me out quite a bit. He's my, my guy in technical services. And then my practical help for the chemotaxis assays is Hortensia Soto. She's an absolute genius for anything that has to do with functional assays. Um, and Laura Dew, who helped me out with um, basic reagents and things like that. So thank you very much for your time and attention.